Uh, welcome to our Redirecting Capital for Racial Equity series, which is a complement to our Capital at a Crossroads paper, which was released in October 2021. Today's conversation is focused on leveraging public equities, and it is the last of our asset class focused discussions. That said, um, given the evolution of this body of work on racial equity, we'll be continuing these conversations with investors to highlight developments and advances as the research advances and the impact measurement um, improves over time. A few housekeeping items. Um, this conversation is being recorded. Uh, today, we intend to have about a 40 minute dialogue with our panelists, and then we'll move into Q&A. If you are joining us by Zoom, please use the Q&A box for all questions. And if you're joining us by LinkedIn, uh, please write your questions in the comment box and we'll gather those towards the end. A quick disclaimer, this information is being provided for educational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Please, can, um, please contact professional um, investment professionals um, if you are making investment decisions. Uh, this work is not possible without um, significant support from Nathan Cummings Foundation and Trillium Asset Management. So it's important that we just take a moment um, just to stop and uh, for me to personally express my appreciation um, for the continued support from these two organizations. Our previous series, um, previous conversations um, can be found on our website, crotoninstitute.org backslash reefs. Um, the Capital at a Crossroads paper um, can also be found there. So if you have not watched any of the previous um, webinars, please feel free to um, go ahead and access those resources on the site. One of the things that we did um, in, to set the foundation for the research that was done in the paper was to define racial equity investing. We largely found that as we interviewed and did desk research that the definition of racial equity investing was absent, um, and, but it was emerging from the conversations that we were having. And so we believe that it incorporates three things that are important if we, weren't, if we want to increase opportunities and increase wealth for communities of color, we must work to dismantle racist systems and institutions. Um, racial equity investing must uh, uh, move or place capital to create those opportunities. Um, and lastly, but certainly not least important, that we need to actually have more significant efforts around measuring the outputs and outcomes of these, of these efforts. The reality, I think, is that for many decades, we've allocated capital in different ways across asset classes to try to solve what I often refer to as the symptoms um, of the racist disease. So poverty, um, housing inequality, housing, um, lack of access to, um, to housing, to affordable housing, um, lack of access to job markets. But if we're not actually looking at how the dollars we're placing actually moves the needle on any of those issues, we're not going to have success. So racial equity investing must have these three components for it to be successful. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce today's panelists, who I'm happy to be having this conversation with and have um, certainly in our prior discussions, think that we're set up for something very delightful today as we sort of think about the history of the ESG and impact investing sphere. Um, let me start by introducing Lisa Hales, who is a Director of International Shareholder Advocacy at Trillium Asset Management, Marcella Pinilla, Director of Sustainable Investing at Zevin Asset Management, Keith Beverly, Managing Partner with Grid202 Partners, and Craig Metrick, Managing Director of Pathstone. I'm going to allow each of our speakers to take a few minutes to um, introduce themselves, provide some background about their firms and how their firms are actually working to approach racial equity. And so, Lisa, let's kick it off with you. Thanks, Charlene, and thanks to everyone for the opportunity to join this uh, very timely and interesting panel. As Charlene explained, I am a Director of International Shareholder Advocacy at Trillium Asset Management. We're a sustainable investment firm headquartered in Boston with offices in San Francisco and also in Edinburgh. Um, we have existed for 40 years. We are 100% dedicated to sustainable investing and leveraging our clients' capital in support of their financial needs, but also for social and environmental impact. So those twin goals have always been front and center. 
And in terms of our work around racial equity and racial justice, I really appreciate the work that Croton has done to create this framework. I think it's incredibly useful and I refer to it regularly <laughs> in my own work <laughs> to, um, because it's not easy. It's not easy. And I think that's the, the starting point of this conversation. Um, Trillium in the fall of 2020 actually uh, put out a paper on kind of the work we've done to date, kind of a summary of our work around racial equity, looking at our firm, uh, the investment team and advocacy. And, and uh, actually one of the few issues that we've always covered in terms of our research has been approaches to diversity and inclusion along with climate change. That's been across the board. Um, but it's fair to say that we had never, we had not gone far enough. We had not really grappled with um, how racism is deeply embedded in our financial system and what that means for our investment approach, how we think about companies that we invest in. And so in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder and the social justice protests, you know, we started a, a period of reflection and uh, really turned the lens internally onto ourselves. And so we are actually ourselves going through a racial equity audit at the moment, which I'm I'm happy to talk about in a little bit more detail later, but I'll also just um, for the group, just drop in the chat, the paper that you mentioned, our kind of summary of kind of what we've been doing on racial equity to date. And I'll just stop there. Marcella. Thank you, Charlene. Hello, everyone. Uh, Marcella Pinilla, I'm Director of Sustainable Investing at Seven Asset Management. And I've worked in the sustainable investing industry for about 14 years. I have served as an ESG analyst and also directing engagement with companies. Uh, and now it's Seven. Uh, Seven has been around since 1994. Uh, we currently manage about 700 million in assets. And my job at Seven is to drive our investments, our investment committee to make decisions that are inclusive of not just ESG related risks and opportunities, but also the impacts that we identify along the way in our investment process. Um, a little bit about me, I am a born New Yorker from Panamanian and Nicaraguan parents and I grew up in Mexico City and honored to be here with my co-panelists. Hi everyone, my name is Keith Beverly. I'm the founder of Grid 202 Partners, um, also the, the managing partner. And thank you Charlene and everyone at Croatan for the invitation and also for the tremendous work that you've done in this space. Um, like Lisa, and I imagine like the other panelists, uh, I reference uh, your work and the paper that you've put together uh, pretty frequently. Um, so our firm, uh, we are a black owned uh, RIA and um, right now, the vast majority of our clients have at least one person in their household that identifies as BIPOC, uh, so over 70% of our clients. And then we also have a good number of what we call uh, John Brown allies, so folks that are uh, very intentional with how they're thinking about impact, um, uh, investing for impact, and aligning their assets and their net worth with their, their values and their principles. Uh, for us personally, um, at the firm, we think about racial equity and what it looks like in portfolios, uh, we have uh, essentially uh, four pillars uh, that we start with. So, so one is uh, we think that we need to see uh, another great migration. So just how we saw uh, black families migrate from the South to the North, uh, we think there needs to be a, a, a great migration of assets uh, from to, to diverse uh, managers. Um, so when we look at uh, the landscape right now, 1.4% of assets are managed by diverse managers across asset classes. Only 0.4% of assets are managed uh, by diverse managers in the mutual fund space. Um, and that's uh, despite the fact that uh, results are comparable, if not better, for, uh, for diverse managers. Um, when, we looked at, when, we, when you look at diverse managers compared to, compared to their counterparts. Um, you know, next for us is we do believe that racial equity is an alpha driver. Um, so to, to Marcella's point, we believe that there are uh, inherent risks that uh, companies face when they don't 
when, when they aren't racially diverse, when they aren't being thoughtful about DEI and in their, in their firms and their practices. We also think there are opportunities that can be unearthed uh, when um, you know really applying a racial equity lens to how you're approaching your business and how you're approaching um, you know the, the landscape in general. Um, when we talk about putting dollars to work uh, in, in the public equity space, what that looks like for us is beginning with a bottoms up approach. Um, so making sure that we're centering the voices of women of color uh, when we're um, investing in a particular company. So for us, we don't necessarily want to hear from Reed Hastings when it comes to DEI. Uh, we'd rather hear from Renee Myers, uh, who is the um, you know, head of diversity at, at Netflix. Uh, we don't want to hear from Jeff Bezos when it comes to um, how Amazon is moving to be a, a more inclusive company and be, being more inclusive um, you know, with their practices. We'd rather hear from Charlotte Newman, who is um, actually filing suit against Amazon right now. Um, and we think that those perspectives, those insights is where the conversation needs to begin when we're talking about racial equity and public equity markets. Uh, and then from there, you, know, you move to some of the, the top down um, the proxies that we have when it comes to the EEO data and then trying to get more of that from, from, uh, from companies as much as we can. Um, so that's kind of our, our framework and our, our four pillars for how we're thinking about racial equity at the firm. Charlene, I didn't want to miss if you asked about our how we share how we shape shareholder advocacy. Um, but I just wanted to add very quickly on on everyone's comments that whatever we're doing needs to be intentional, and we're here because we want to go beyond what is already being done. Um, and you mentioned out outcomes, measurable outcomes. Um, I, I think you're running, you're running through the rest of the conversation. Can I have you hold that for a me, second so we can have Craig introduce himself? But I wouldn't, we will come back absolutely, to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just didn't want to be remiss in saying that there is intentionality in everything we're doing um, as part of my introduction. Thank you. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. And, and again, thank you to uh, Croatan and, and Charlene and, and Nicole panelists uh, for having me. Uh, I'm Craig Metric, a, a managing director at Pastone. Uh, Pastone is uh, about 12 years old. Uh, we're a, a $30 billion um, multifamily office uh, and RIA providing uh, full investment advisory wealth management services to, uh, to families uh, as well as institutions. Um, Pastone has a long uh, history um, working in the, in the ESG and impact space uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, I and several colleagues joined Pastone uh, from a firm called Cornerstone. Uh, Cornerstone uh, was a impact uh, advisor, uh, a boutique firm serving only uh, investors um, uh, focused on, on social and environmental impact. Um, the transition to Pathstone has has been interesting, and I and I must say, um, very positive from from an impact standpoint, from a cultural standpoint. Um, there is certainly work to do, as I think we all uh, acknowledge. Um, but Pathstone uh, has has signed the the Confluence Belonging Pledge, which uh, commits signatories to discuss uh, diversity and racial equity specifically at investment committee uh, meetings within the firm and, and try to embed it across the investment processes at the firm. Uh, we do have a, uh, a DEI council at the firm that is cross-functional and led by the highest executives at the firm. Um, that's been in place um, since 2020, I believe. Um, we started, um, well, I would say Cornerstone and Pastone started tracking manager diversity data uh, at, at, at about the same time, um, 2018, 2019. Um, we are also working on a, a social justice um, model portfolio, uh, which will take into account um, racial diversity and other elements of social justice across a diversified portfolio that we can offer to clients and track as, as one of our uh, model portfolios. Um, we continue at Pastone, um, Cornerstone's heritage of, of doing uh, what we call thematic research. So um, Cornerstone did a paper on 
racial equity investing in, in 2018, and we refreshed that in 2020. Um, we did one on, on income inequality in 2014 and, and updated that in 2017. And, and we continue to, to do that work at, at Pathstone as well. Um, I think for, for context, maybe um, I, I said maybe in a little different position from some of the other panelists. Um, so Pathstone is not uh, picking stocks. We, we don't have our own products. Um, we are looking at the work of, of Marcella and Lisa and, and Keith and choosing managers to recommend uh, to our clients. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll stop there, but look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you, Craig. So I wanna sort of start by um, doing a little bit of reflection. I, I think each of you have been in the space for um, a long period of time. And one of the things that has been most notable to me is that within the ESG landscape, we have largely tended to focus very heavily on the E. Um, we have gotten a lot of focus um, on the G, the governance piece, but the S seems to have been the weakest piece. Um, and I think given, um, this current moment where we, we as a country or nation were focused on racial equity and things like the Me Too movement, which has, again, I think re-energized the gender focus. Um, it seems to me that the S needs to actually be a driver, right? Um, and so I'd love to hear a bit about whether or not you think within the public equity space that the moment has arrived for the S to actually push, push the research forward and really, lead to long-term systemic change. Because ultimately, as, as I said in the definition, the systemic and institutional change is a piece that will be foundational while we're doing all the other things like placing the capital. Um, and so, Marcella, I, I, the comment you made on intentionality is right on point. Mm -hmm. um, we, as an investment community, need to be much more intentional about the S. Um, and because you use that word, I'm actually going to let you go first, Marcella, and then I'll have Lisa jump, jump in and um, keep uh -huh. it great. Thank you. So, look, I, I think we are making progress as investors in racial equity. Um, truly, uh, we're getting closer. Um, and it's an iteration. I think we're all learning. Um, when we were looking at human rights broadly um, at a global level, we then started focusing on you know, D, E, and I, and even more focus with racial equity at, at, at a more US level and structural level. So I think we've made a lot of progress there. Um, I think impact investing outside of the public markets can move money directly to marginalized groups. And we can't directly do that in public equities Shareholder advocacy is how we get the closest to the front lines of the impact to then being intentional about what we want to change. And we have tools that Lisa and I can talk a lot about. Um, shareholder advocacy has gotten much more focused because we're not just looking at gender on one hand and race on the other. We understand um, the intersectionality more and more of where the impacts are and what we need to do. And if we zoom out, we have made substantial progress uh, we, because we've created those airwaves. We've contributed to creating the space to have conversations, to reflect on ourselves, like Lisa said in her introduction. And it's catalyzed a lot of conversations, new alliances with stakeholders, Chris Smalls is somebody that I would want to hear from, Keith, for example, instead of Jay Be Jeff Bezos at Amazon. Um, you know, it's it's been positive. And being intentional about advocacy is something that I, I don't think I would have said years ago. I think now it's very clear how outputs is the numbers and outcomes is what changes for the people, the workers, the frontline workers that we're trying to address through our advocacy, patients, um, employees, those stakeholders, we need to hear from them on whether our efforts as investors have paid off. And I think we're getting better at, at catching that. 
So I'm probably going to sound a little bit more pessimistic than Marcella, unfortunately. I am going to say, you know, I have this quote here from the sister of Jacob Blake, who's a man who was shot in Wisconsin. He survived, shot by the police. And, he, and she said, I'm tired and I want justice. And I'm tired. And I would like to see us really focus on justice. And I will just say that the kinds of, like, on the one hand, the eruption of complaints about CRT, the attacks on, on health care for trans kids, the pushback on uh, mm -hmm. reproductive health care, mm -hmm. those are indications that some of our arguments are hitting the mark. You know, this is the pushback against the issues that we have identified and we are raising up. And, you know, first they laugh, then they fight us, then we win. So I think we're in the middle portion here. Um, and as I think about, you know, so th this comes in waves. We see, you know, progress and then we see the pushback. Two steps forward, one steps back. And I will just mention that the research that I'm familiar with, a professor that I met at Harvard, Frank Dobbin, who's done research, particularly on diversity and inclusion, and has research to say that in the aftermath of the civil rights, and this is relevant to investing because it's the context that we operate in. In the aftermath of the civil rights movement in the 60s, progress was made for about 20 years until the 80s. And then it stagnated. I'm not saying it was like, you know, a single line going up. His research suggests that the number of African-American managers, for example, in corporate America has either stagnated or declined since the 80s. So that's something that we as investors who are purportedly advocating for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and justice, we have to hold ourselves accountable for like how impactful are we being if this is actually what's happening on the ground. So I do think that we've had some successes to Marcella's point. There have been some advances made. Um, we can talk about like the shareholder proposals that have been uh, advanced around racial equity, around paid time off, sick leave. These are all racial justice issues. Reproductive health, that is a racial justice issue. Um, and these are issues that our firms are pushing alongside our collaborators uh, within the sustainable and responsible investment space. So though I'm by nature an optimistic person, I also am very clear-eyed about the pushback that is currently underway. It is significant. Um, it is sustained. Um, and we have, I think this community, we have to be very strategic about our own approach and how we think about both positioning ourselves and the work that we need to do in order to advance our goals. So I hope that's not too pessimistic, but um, I think it's important to be very clear eyed about the situation we're in. Before I let Keith and Craig go, I think one of the things that you've just highlighted is that we need a barometer for how the system changes, right? The comments that you just made about sort of the number of diverse asset managers falling since the 80s is consistent with what I've heard from an um, uh, uh, employment law attorney that I know. And he talked about sort of the numbers of cases um, around discrimination and how those cases increase and how they show up in some sectors more than others, um, which you would think that if we're making progress, they should trend down but that has not been the data. Um, so I feel like that's a really important point. So I'm gonna put it on sort of our minds to think about how do we measure system change, right? Cause we could measure the ground level change, but if the system isn't doing what it needs to do, which is what your, your that analysis says, then something is wrong. So I'm, I'm gonna let Keith and, and Craig and then we'll kind of keep the conversation moving. Yeah. Um... That's a big question that you just posed, Charlene. So <laughs> I look forward to, uh, to coming back to that one. Uh, I'll, I'll, um, I'll piggyback off of, of something Marcella mentioned when, when she, she mentioned public equities not being uh, a place where you can really get a uh, substantial um, bang for your buck, if, if you will, when it comes to uh, racial equity and social impact. And like the way that we frame investing across asset classes with a racial equity lens for, for our clients is that uh, certain asset classes are going to be primary drivers, others secondary drivers, and others tertiary drivers, right? And we consider public equities to be secondary drivers. So there's 
um, a lot of information we would want to see that we don't have access to. Um, and when you talk about shareholder engagement and really looking to move companies forward uh, along that uh, along that spectrum of doing what's right, um, shareholder engagement is um, and, and activism is you know, without a doubt, without a doubt, uh, necessary and um, and relevant. Uh, but when you, you talk about um, direct impact on communities of color um, and what that looks like, you know, for us, we I mean, many of our clients are, are thought leaders in, in the DEI space, and they're the, they're they, they work at the firm and they have the consulting shops that these companies are going to when you know the, the George Floyd um, uprising um, you know took hold. And for us, uh, there, there's a certain element of, of urgency. Uh, where, and particularly on this issue where we can't get it wrong and we had to be thoughtful, have to be um, kind of forward looking in how we're approaching uh, allocating uh, client capital uh, in this space. Um, so I think that that intentionality is is, is important to, to Lisa's point around um, you know, having a, you know, being pragmatic and how we think about where we have, have come from and where we are today. Uh, and how and the progression, um, you know, I, I'm fairly impatient, and, and, and from my vantage point, uh, the progress has been a, at a glacial pace. Uh, so for for us, when you have a, a level of impatience, and you know, you don't want to wait for a, another travesty to occur for um, companies to decide that they're going to disclose EEO data, uh, but you still have the the mandate of of, of allocating uh, client capital. Um, it it, it, it it causes for a lot of um, you know being, being thoughtful. Um, so you know for us, it's been um, you know since uh, you know the uprises and in, in the in the awakening, uh, it's been a lot of conversation that we've had with our clients and really taking a barometer of you know does this does our strategy does our rationale um, sit well with you right um, because uh, for us you know, empowering and giving voice to to um, to people of color in a racial equity strategy when you're investing with a, with a racial equity lens is, um, you know, is the right thing to do and, and also uh, makes the most sense for, for us and for our clients. So I, I think it's worth um, uh, doing just, just a little bit of <laughs> A little bit of history. Your, your point, um, Charlene, at the, at the top about um, you know the the S being being later to the game as a focus in in ESG. Um, you know, looking back on the, on the roots of of SRI or ESG or impact in in this country, it was you know social. It was screening based on social motivations, no weapons, you know, no tobacco, no alcohol. Um, this, this focus is different, but I think, I think the, the foundation um, for the, the acknowledgement and the care of, of social issues is, is there and, and, and still there in this community. Um, we, you know, the, the other panelists have talked about the, the, the data issues, the, the struggle to get even basic diversity data on, on companies, that's, yeah, that's true. That's incredibly frustrating. And I, and I think it's, it's a barrier to the kind of impact we all think can be achieved and, and, um, and, and should be achieved in public equity. One encouraging point that I'll um, throw out there is that our clients that, that wanna see impact and it's a growing number are not waiting for perfect data, um, they are uh, they are impatient as well, Keith. Um, they're you know as we all know, I think there are you know millions of dollars, um, hopefully many many millions, hopefully billions, but there are millions of dollars on the sidelines waiting for a cool new you know investment structure or or type or company that can change things for the better. And and we have clients, and I know others do too, that will take that that risk. Um, the, the last thing I'll say is that early in my career in this space, uh, I was working for an ESG data firm and, uh, I was at a conference and, and heard a story, an anecdote, uh, from a very large company. I think it was Anheuser-Busch. Um, and it was, it was a story that 
that kept me, you know, interested in this in this industry. And it was on the environmental side. But the company was talking about how on their cans of beer, um, in their move to take regular size tabs and remember the big mouth cans. Remember when they came out with the bigger tabs? The amount of uh, the amount of high polluting material that they didn't have to put in as part of the can because the tab was bigger was going to impact significantly the amount of toxic emissions they were going to generate, the amount of highly um, polluting processes they needed to take stuff out of the ground. So the impact that a seemingly little move by a very large company can have on the environment um, you know, that I, I still think about that story because I think about other issues now, such as racial equity and a relatively, you know, a relatively small move, something I'm sure we all think should already be being done by the big companies in America. Uh, a relatively small move can have a big impact. And as we all know, you know, leaders lead and, and follow, followers follow. One good example can lead to a bunch of companies, um, you know, doing the same thing. So I, uh, I won't comment on my pessimism and optimism. I go back and forth depending on the news of the day, but uh, but I think there are encouraging signs, and I, and I think public equity, you know, we have to reinforce that to clients and prospects all the time. They're like, well, we'll we'll exclude some stuff from from public equity, but you know, give us the real impact in private equity, and, and we have to stop and say, no, there there's shareholder engagement. There's real intention behind private uh, between. Uh, in public equity strategies, we need to pay attention to the impact there uh, as well, as well as who's who's managing the managers, um, you know, the diversity of the firms themselves. Now I'll start. Great, that's helpful. I'm going to come back to something that you said because it triggered um, the intersectionality word, which is one that we use a lot at Croatan. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a little while. I want to sort of move this conversation to um, power shift. Um, in lots of the conversations, and I think certainly in the research, um, one of the things that was highlighted was that racial equity um, investing must incorporate a power shift. And I think that we're all struggling to understand what that looks like in practice. And I think different asset classes, it may look very different. And I think certainly, um, the pandemic, uh, George Floyd's death, I was um, hearing this morning on the radio that suicides um, during COVID um, were significantly higher. There were up 35 gun-related deaths were up 35%, um, which includes self-inflicted. Um, and one of the points that they made was that um, Black men of a certain age group, I think it was between like 14 to 25, you'd have to double check the article, but... Um, were among the highest groups, the highest uh, groups that were impacted. And then they correlated that with poverty, right? Um, and so we know that in order for us to shift um, the economics in the United States and to, to um, close this huge wealth gap that has a large historical um, track record and explanation, that we have to do things different. And so that in part, I think, means that we have to understand that if we don't invest in people and communities, um, companies are actually taking on a different type of risk. So the question that I specifically want you to address as we sort of think about this need for some kind of power shift that gives people greater voice and presence um, is how does that show up specifically in the public e equities realm, um, which means that you have to be thinking about the risk associated with social and racial inequalities um, and inequities. So I'd love to sort of hear your thoughts. And um, this time, I think we'll, Keith, we'll start with you and then have Marcella and Lisa and Craig piggyback. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We're, we're actually, my colleague, uh, Deborah Dayenju is, is working on a, a paper that should be coming out um, in the next month or so in collaboration with an NGO looking at um, inequities and how it manifests itself, how they manifest in, in public equities and across other asset classes. So, um, so she might be better positioned to actually answer this question. Is <laughs> where I was getting at with that. With that. With that. Uh, Did I invite the wrong speakers? <laughs> For this particular question, maybe. Um, but it's tough. It's tough because, uh, especially when you think about um, most publicly traded companies are going to have a national presence, if not global presence, right? And um, engaging populations, engaging communities 
throughout the country around particular issues uh, is, is going to be tough because so much of it is going to be local. Um, but I think what it what it could look like is coordination among uh, shareholder uh, engagement and shareholder activists with uh, communities that are going to be impacted. And, re- and asset classes like real estate is, is more uh, simple. So if you look at multifamily housing, for instance, like that's that's, uh, you know, you, you can you know, you know look at certain communities and talk to folks in those pr- particular communities. Um, you could also look at where companies are headquartered um, and, and kind of look at it that way. But it, it, has, to, it has to be um, if you're really talking about power shift and, and um, giving voice to um, communities of color that are impacted by public equities, it's, it's, it has to be like on the state and, and on the local level and, and coordinating uh, amongst shareholders and coordinating amongst, um, amongst those in the communities. And to any extent that you guys have examples of what, if that's emerging, would love to hear those as well. Uh, I I wanted to highlight a proposal that got filed with Amazon again, asking for an employee to join the board of directors or at least a committee. And that was filed, I think, by, by Oxfam, maybe others too. And that strikes me as, you know, within our toolbox of shareholder engagement tools to ask a company how are you going to include the worker voice in this? And that's a really good way to start building accountability. I worry about the repercussions too, about adding just one employee, just like we also worry about adding, you know, one female uh, woman board, board member to a, you know, 20 person board. I think, you know, just socially, we need to have the tools to empower that worker too. So, um, aside from that proposal, you know, coworker.org, um, you may know them. They are helping employees at companies like Kroger and Amazon and other businesses that just rely on this low cost labor. So they don't really care about turnover to really start building some internal knowledge about how to engage internally and how to organize internally. That's very valuable because one of the things that I've learned from coworkers and their and their engagement with employees is that because there's so much turnover, no one remembers. There's no leader. People come and go, and so there's no organization. This helps to, um, you know, from providing stipends so employees can self-organize to training on what is shareholder advocacy? How can you get involved? Um, We spoke with Alphabet employees, for example, who are going to move the proposals um, and also vote on their proposals um, filed at Alphabet on climate change. That's empowering to workers like employees. And at the front line, you know, we have, like I said, workers that are building up their knowledge on how to engage. So those are some examples of how we're thinking creatively of including the worker voice. Um, And I can give an example on um, a successful engagement with Prober later. Um, So I've been, thanks, Marcella. I love the idea of the worker voice. And obviously because of the pandemic and the complete shutdown of the economy and the restarting of the economy, I think one of the things that all of us understand is the brittleness of some of, you know, the lack of resiliency, you know, things, um, or just stretch to the very limit. And so that's why paid sick leave is so important, why we've advocated for that with, you know, with a shareholder proposal at CVS, for example. Didn't get a majority of the vote, but did get, I think, 30 plus percent of the vote, which is, um, you know, one of the things I will say about shareholder proposals is that in the last two years, in part because of a policy change at the SEC on social issues, um, the votes have been much higher than they were in the past. We got majority votes on on conducting uh, racial equity audits at Johnson & Johnson, for example, and at Apple. Um, So looking forward to uh, 
hopefully meeting with the companies and, and, and seeing what actually operationalizing that will look like. But I wanted to speak specifically to your question about like what, how can we connect um, communities? How can we, what does it mean for an investor to invest with a racial justice lens and have communities at the center of that? So when I think about it, I think about like, what are the tools at our disposal? Our proxy voting. So we joined with a group of other investors who are all members of the Racial Justice Investing Coalition to call for companies to prioritize racial and ethnic diversity at the board level. Uh, we're looking for them to commit to um, board slates of at least 30% uh, racially and ethnically diverse directors. And as far as gender diversity is concerned, we're expecting 50%. We're 50% of the population, 30% is not enough <laughs> any longer. Um, but we're still members of the 30% coalition. We're just like, that's how we're voting. We invite other investors to join us. You can sign up to the letter if you haven't already on the Racial Justice Investing website. So there's, there's one simple action. Another thing we've been doing is asking companies to provide paid time off to vote for their employees. Voting rights are hugely, hugely important. We all know that our, well, I believe our democracy is under attack. In some, certain, you know, some situations, that is a controversial statement. I hope it's not controversial here. Um, we've been able to convince several companies, including Apple, PNC, and Bank of America to provide their employees at least four hours, either to expand or to initiate new programs to provide four hours paid time off to vote uh, in elections. Um, my colleague, Haywan is leading that work and continuing to engage with companies across our portfolio on something as simple as that. We're, you know, we joined with other investors on, who are probably on this call to support the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, which unfortunately is unlikely to pass Congress. But to me, that is part and parcel of having a racial justice lens on our work. It's not simply the individual companies we're investing in, though that is important. We're obviously avoiding companies. We have a screening process which avoids companies which have some of the more egregious practices, you know, payday lending, for example. But really, because of the way our economy is structured, the way finance works, racism is deeply embedded in every aspect of what we do. You know, it's kind of like the air that we're breathing. And so as someone who's in the system, part of the system, benefiting as someone, as a representative of asset owners, um, we're trying to use every single tool, our votes, our research process, and our advocacy um, to, to expand the way we can, um, we can bring these discussions to companies in our portfolio and to other investors, frankly. So again, I say everything touches on, on racial equality. You know, we have proposals at, at banks around financing um, uh, additional, to stop financing additional uh, fossil fuel initiatives. Why? Uh, because if we do finance those, we'll blow way past the one and a half degree rise in temperature. But the communities that will be most impacted by that rise will be black and brown communities, most definitely. So it's a racial justice issue as well as an environmental issue. Here's the intersectionality that Charlene was speaking about. We see that over and over and over again across so many issues that we're um, touching uh, in our work day to day. <sighs> I'm, as I said, optimistic by nature, but there's a lot going on. I feel like we got glimpses of optimistic Lisa. <laughs> Where is she? Like deep, deep, deep. Right. Um, so Charlene, I'm, I'm happy to talk a little bit about um, our evaluation and selection process of managers, if that would be helpful in, in the public equity space, but it doesn't directly, you know, get to your question about, about communities, but. Um, and maybe also Craig, how are you pushing managers that aren't doing and aren't leading? Um, mm -hmm. to do better. Yes. Uh, okay. So, um, so we are proactively um, collecting and reporting to clients um, racial and, and gender diversity information on, on uh, all of our approved managers, not, not just the um, ESG or, or, or sustainability managers or impact managers. Um, so we are, we are collecting that data. Um, 
we first, uh, our first compilation of the data was done last year. Um, we're now rearranging our survey a little bit. That'll go out later this year. Um, but we want to we want to show clients and show managers um, that we want this data. Increasingly, our clients and prospective clients are are asking for this data, and so that's part of that's part of the education process. That this is um, you know this is no longer an issue. You can um, it's another sign, I think, of the maturity of the issue within within the broader ESG space. We've seen this, you know, countless times with lots of issues and, and it's, you know, way past time for um, for diversity and racial equity to, to reach this threshold. Um, so we are collecting information, we are reporting it out to clients, we are talking to managers. Um, and I, I wouldn't say we've institutionalize this, formalize this across all asset classes and every manager conversation. That, that's a work in progress, frankly, and, and we'll, we'll admit that it's something we want to do. Um, but, um, but we are having those conversations with managers and we're learning how to ask. I think it's really important. We're learning how to ask the follow-up questions. So a manager tells us that they have a DEI council and they have targets for diversity. Um, that next level of questions uh, is really important. Well, how are you going to track progress? Are you letting your employees know about this? You know, what, where, where do we see the, the you know, the outcomes from this um, in, in your materials? And, you know, are they ready to share those publicly? So I think those conversations are uh, increasing in frequency and I think increasing in, in impact, managers are getting the uh, getting the message um, that this is something that more and more investors and, and intermediaries like us want to know. Um, I'll I'll also admit to you know we have a lot of clients very interested in this issue. Um, it's not always the only impact they're interested in, so we are also in that position of. We want to find as many quality, diverse managers as we can. We also need the underlying investments to be impactful um, for a lot of our clients. So we need that. Um, it's a different kind of intersectionality. We we need that. We need that overlap. And and I think we can all imagine the universe gets smaller as you as you start putting more um, requirements on it. So that's something we're working on too. And it's. Uh, it's difficult in creating a multi-manager platform um, for, you know, I think we have about a thousand clients. Um, we have existing relationships we need to maintain. We want to balance that with new relationships that we that we start forming. So we're ready when those managers get, you know, too mature, too successful, um, or something happens to them. Um, we need impactful strategies. Uh, we need diverse managers. You know, so again, finding that balance is not uh, is not easy. And we've also acknowledged uh, internally. So uh, don't tell anyone. But we know we have to go beyond our um, typical processes for sourcing managers. We need to find different managers. And you know, we from the cornerstone team or in the impact space, we get new stuff in our inbox all the time we need to go beyond that as well. Um, so we can find, you know, the, the best managers, the broadest universe of, of managers and give our clients the diverse platform that we want them to have from, from an investment standpoint, from a racial standpoint, from a gender standpoint, um, and, and, and all of it. So there's a lot that's, uh, that's in process, but I think there is ability through being intentional and having processes um, to, you know, to have an impact, to, to impact the power shift, however, uh, however gradually. That's all helpful. Um, you said gradually, I'm like, yeah, we have to rush. <laughs> we got to turn well, the top on. <laughs> I mean, we're 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 rushing, but the impact is still going to be gradual, right? Yeah. Like we we have to do our work, um, and believe it or not, clients always don't take our recommendations. It doesn't. It's not always that easy. So, even if we had a platform, you know, a fully developed platform of of uh, diverse managers, you know, 
that power shift is still going to take uh, is still going to take time, unfortunately. No, you're you're absolutely right, and I certainly given the legacy of the United States and this long history of racism and um, discrimination that we've had. It's over a hundred years, so yes, I often say to people that it will it will take time, but I do think that you know we have an opportunity while hopefully the moment is hot and continues to be in that we recognize that as the demographics of the nation shift, we have to invest in all of the people in this country if we want to continue to be the nation that leads in this world, be one of the nations that lead. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, you know, I I recognize that, but I'm I'm, I'm a little impatient as well. Um, I want to sort of shift to the research that underlies um, the selection of companies and, and even managers for, for that. Um, I imagine that in the last, you know, 24 months or so that the research has had to, um, has had to be stretched. Um, I think oftentimes when we talk about um, racial equity, we do the DEI proxy, right? It's sort of the best lens that we have. Um, so I'd love to hear about research that's intentionally looking at the issue of race and racism and how that might be shaping the thinking um, within sort of the stock selection process and or how you do your advocacy work. And um, I think, let's see, I'll, I'll start with Marcel on this one. Well, I'll start with the, you know, how we choose stocks. And of course, there's a constellation of ESG issues that we identify as risks, as opportunities. Like I said, we also look at impacts that are created. But if I think if I could choose, um, if I had to choose a company just based on racial issues, I don't think I would choose any company at this point. Um, I know there's good companies out there doing this, but I think when we look at a business model um, from the you know, financial analyst side and the ESG analyst side, just looking at how a company makes money. If you have employees as a cost in your accounting, not as an investment, you, you, you're automatically, from my perspective, saying, you know what, this they have it all wrong and you know to to the to share a little pessimism <laughs> if that doesn't change then no di effort is going to really shift that's that's the big winner we invest in companies like amazon that have this extractive business model and i think our job is to design advocacy that is getting at those systemic effects of having this extractive model and and trying to change it. And right now I think we are, we're looking at the symptoms like that turnover, the lack of paid sick leave, which is symptomatic also of just the, just the companies are are not interested the misclassification of workers. If you're part-time, you're, you're pretty much out of, out of luck. Um, so all of this to say that designing advocacy that looks at a company's revenue model and looks to address that revenue model is, is very important. I won't say that I've changed Amazon's or Zevin or anyone has changed Amazon's way, but that's what, that's what I think we need to ultimately do is put employees at the forefront as an investment. And we're doing that through our proposals and our conversations through various angles, whether it's linking ESG or social factors to compensation or conducting a racial equity audit. It's all to look at those gaps and to see what how we can ultimately improve the worker voice, improve benefits, make jobs, not just jobs, but quality jobs. I'll stop there. Please don't get me going more. <laughs> um, Alisa. Yeah, I will. So I, I'm thinking about, so as in the fall of 2020, in addition to that racial equity uh, paper that kind of looked at our advocacy, our CIO led work um, 
our investment team reached out to all the companies, almost 400 companies on our approved list to explain to them that racial equity mattered to us as a firm, that we wanted to understand what their practices were in order to identify leading practices across various sectors. And then, you know, kind of help that feedback into the investment process, which is the first, you know, our advocacy team very, very much works alongside our investment team, but this was driven by the investment team, by the C CIO, the portfolio managers and the analysts who reached out to their contacts who met, who like explained like, this is an investment team driven questionnaire. We actually put a summary on our website and I can, I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, before the end of this, but I mentioned that to say, but even with that, and we identified some leading practices, even if um, I think about 70% of the companies on our approval list actually responded. So it was pretty good response rate, you know, larger companies are more likely to respond than smaller ones, et cetera. Um, but even the best practices didn't do what Charlene was pointing to, which is that shift in power. So you can have an excellent, so that's why data in and of itself is necessary, but not sufficient. Like we can get all kinds of data on the DEI practices. And there was a question in the chat about how do you measure inclusion with difficulty? <laughs> it's my response to that questioner. Um, you know, we're kind of approximating it based on indicators that we can get a hold of um, because there isn't like a huge basket of data that allows us to assess. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to press companies to, to Craig's point, just release like even the basic information. And to Keith's point, like just share that EEO1 data that you're required to collect and that you don't share with investors. Hey, we care about these issues. And I think to Marcella's point, like part of what our community is trying to do is make clear to the companies that we want them to take these so-called extra financial issues into like consideration of their business model. It's, it's fundamental that the treatment of workers, suppliers, the community at large, that in a nutshell is what we're trying to do. Extend, you know, the kind of time frame for the consideration of what actually is material. That is how we kind of center a racial justice lens by saying, hey, these things are actually really, really important. It's not an easy thing to do. We continually, I, I just wanted to make sure that we don't get too hung up on like data is the solution. It's part of the solution, but it's not the total solution. Or, you know, it, it's a multifaceted uh, problem. So it needs a multifaceted solution. And I'll stop there. Craig, keep. Uh, Keith, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I, I just put a couple of articles um, in the chat. I think are relevant to, to this um, part of the discussion. I, I agree with with Marcella and really with Lisa. Have just expressed that uh, data. Well, one, the data is lacking, right? So um, yes, we need more data, but the, the data that we do have um, doesn't speak to the issue um, on a granular level. The way that the way that uh, we would like. And I think the only way you get there, um, well, at least the easiest way to get there right now is to actually engage with the employees and understand what it's like for them at these companies, right? So I think that that's a starting point. And then from there, we can build out a framework around, um, you know, what's the impact of this, you know, asset of this sector on communities of color? What's the impact on this particular, of this particular company, on their work their worker base and that's information that the company can share right so the company can let you know and can inform you of the you know average compensation for the black employees white employees latinx etc uh, so those types of that type of data is where we would want the is where we want the data to go um, as opposed to where, where we are now where we just you know kind of have um you know high level and, and just and just um, you know, statistics that um, are helpful, but but don't get to some of the insights that we would really use as, as a gauge for uh, what company, what employees at the companies are are, are feeling, and um, you know their their thoughts on their experience at their particular company. It's hard to 
quantitatively measure a culture, right? Like that's kind of what we're talking about is it's, it's hard to get to culture from quantitative data. So we face, you know, the same struggles with, um, with evaluating managers. One of the changes, um, in fact, there's a me- there's an internal meeting going on now to finalize our manager survey, but I'm here instead, so I got my comments in early. But one of the things we're trying to do with that survey is is get more to um, to to culture, so not just the list of benefits, but you know what what has the manager done to um, to enable or or facilitate that that power shift and it, and it's difficult you know there's going to be some trial and error um, to to get to those questions that that will make sense the the other thing I'll say just you know for the sake of of information I think we all have a sense of this but uh, our clients even our clients who talk you know most vocally about this issue um, don't have and this is us I know there are different clients with with other folks but um, but even our clients that are taking this issue most seriously and and most uh, you know kind of proactively and aggressively don't have a lot of you know metrics targets policies definitions around around what they want to see um, you know so we have we have one client uh, a foundation that said, you know, over over time, and we're you know discussing with them what that time frame is. We want our portfolio. We want the managers in our portfolio to um, to look like the demographics of the U.S. Like, okay, that that's a great goal. Um, you know, how do you how do you measure that diversity? Is it is it ownership in the firm? Is it economic interest in the strategy? If you're talking about private markets, is it um, you know, is it the investment professionals? Is it all staff? Like, how, how do we look at diversity? And, and so those are some of the things we're trying to dig into with, you know, with our internal colleagues, with our clients and, and with managers. So we, um, you know, we suffer from some of the dam- same data struggles as, uh, as uh, my co-panelists uh, looking, at, looking at public companies. That's good. Um, I appreciate sort of hearing each of you speak to that. Um, I, I think what I would certainly say is that when I started in this space in 1999, 2000, um, there were lots of narratives around sort of the, the data that we didn't have, right? Um, but we made a lot of progress. Um, so the optimistic part of me says, we'll make progress. Um, but we have to start asking for the information. And I think as a research organization, the thing that we would often say is uh, quantitative data is a type of data, but the qualitative piece, all the other things, the culture, those things are equally as important um, and often tell a different type of story. Um, and I think each of you sort of touched on that, right? Um, you, the quantitative doesn't tell you everything. Um, and so it just, I think, underscores that we do have a lot of work to do, but I wanted to ask this question very intentionally because I think there's a community of people who are working on this, all struggling, and to let them know that this is where we are. This is actually part of our, our norm. Um, there are a few questions and go ahead, Marcella. If I could just add, um, as the optimist on this panel, um, just a, a little bit on what we have seen beyond EO1. And I, it relates to a question a, a participant posted about the data that Lisa also answered. And I, I, to my, rem, I remember asking companies about EO1 data. I don't remember in 2008 asking companies, what is your retention rates mm-hmm. broken down by worker segment? What is your uh, promotion rate? How do you attract employees? I think those are really incisive questions. Having that data isn't going to instantly change the condition of an employee, but it sure is going to help us keep companies accountable. And that kind of data, I think, is it's good. Then mm-hmm. there's, there's individual points that we want to just tweak. And racial equity is not a, a turnkey solution. It's a lens, right? But if we're talking about the work of Meredith Benton on those anti-arbitration clauses that are removing the obstacle for the employee, 
to then be empowered to say, you know, I was sexually harassed or uh, because of my race, I feel I didn't get promoted. That, that removing of obstacle, I think is very important. And that's a data point. Does the company have or not have a, a, an anti-arbitration clause? And then it's unpacking, it's unpacking. We are constantly unpacking, but just a point on that. I hope, I hope people feel a little better. There, I mean, not, not to get too far into the weeds, but there are limits, I think, to what investors can ask for during the shareholder process before a company says, well, you know, turnover rates or something that's of strategic business importance to us. So we're not going to, we're not going to put those out publicly, at least. Is that, is that right? That's a question because I don't, we don't do that work. So, well, um, well, Mer there is there is progress on that. If you go to visit Whistle Stop, I think um, it's very very slow. Like all of this too, but it is getting it is hitting a nerve because getting a company to release that data is is pretty it's pretty hard when you have like a company again. I go back to Kroger since we filed a proposal. Um, they are not willing to disclose. Those, those trends, which you cannot see in, in an EO1 report. If anyone knows how to analyze year-on-year -year EO1 reports, please let me know because that's, that's, that's a snapshot in time. We want to see over time across the workforce, did a manager help retain his team? Did he get them to take their benefits? Did he get them to schedule uh, their shifts in a way that is humane? All of that is part of the Kroger uh, Zevin Asset Management Agreement to tie how they compensate ma associate managers all the way to senior executives. That data is not going to be released. So we're trying to get them to the, to the table to say, look, next year we might file a proposal asking for this exact data. Um, I think it's tough. I think it gets tougher the closer you get to the core yeah. of the of the reveal. The closer you so, get to that power shift, unfortunately. I think just, some of the is, Go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, which is why the pushback has been so vociferous. Mm -hmm. I think we've answered some of the questions. Um, mindful of time, I'm going to look at one question that um, sort of came in just a few minutes ago. Um, it's the last one. Um, it's um, have you worked with place-based investors in specific communities and local civic action groups to advance the changes we seek? So I'll make that the final question and then we'll wrap up. This was a great conversation, guys. So who would like to take a strike at that one? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I can take a quick shot at it. So this, is, this looks a little off the topic of Public equity, but but we do have we do have place based clients that are involved in in local initiatives um, uh, around housing, around health, and so it it sometimes is you know outside of our scope as investment advisors or wealth managers, but we have uh, expertise within our team on on philanthropic efforts, on community development efforts, so we. Yeah, we, we certainly help where we can, um, but that's, you know, for us, that work is, is typically outside of, uh, of public equity. It's not related to shareholder activism or trying to get clients to, um, you know, to vote or support shareholder resolutions, which we do as well. And maybe another version of this question that I might just add before Keith responds. So um, in the fixed income uh, webinar that we did, we talked a bit about, um, you know, as that work evolves and potentially begins to look at corporate debt, um, would there be a way for um, folks on the investing on the fixed income side, targeting specific companies to work with the public equity investors on sort of shared alliance issues? Um, and so that that, that kind of gets you across as a class and the public equity investors have the the ownership stakers, but potentially there's like something there where you where you, you're leveraging the network. So maybe add a little bit more context for that question as well, Keith. Yeah, I, I was I was curious as to whether or not she or, or Marcy uh, was um, 
addressing the question from a public equities public equities perspective or or other asset classes i, I was curious if if, uh, if that was the case um but I, I agree with with craig that it's it's difficult when um when you're looking at, at public equities because you know like i said earlier just the the, the nation the, the the nature of the companies being uh, so large and having such a, a large footprint um when you look at you know, municipal bonds, CDFIs, um, and, you know, private, you know, private equity vehicles. I think it's a much clearer case that you can make and that you can begin to build uh, when it comes to, to racial equity. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, she was trying to get at the multi-asset class potential power dynamic. That's yeah. So, yeah. so we're, we're big advocates of total portfolio activation. We think that, uh, there's an opportunity to uh, uh, to center social and environmental positive impact in every asset class. The tools are different. The scope of uh, the range of activities or opportunities are different. But um, bringing that lens, I think, is is definitely possible. And I think for um, mission-driven organizations in particular, but also for individuals and families, and on the community investment side, we run a comprehensive community investment program for our clients where they can invest in sustainable agriculture or low-income housing or, you know, we have opportunities for them. Again, it's outside of the public equity space. It's generally uh, through debt, like notes. Um, And, uh, you know, we just try and facilitate our clients' ability to put a portion of their portfolios um, to work directly. I'm not sure what uh, the what she meant by civic action organ. I think she mentioned, not sure what that means specifically, but I'm happy to, would love to talk offline about that because I'm not sure what that means. Awesome. Um, A thought on this. um, Final thought. Go ahead. Final thought on fixed income. And that is the, the prison industry and at a municipal level, the underwriters of municipal bonds that help to build or expand new prisons. Alabama actually started calling its prison expansion project a social bond. So that shining a light on that is, I think is very important. Whether it's, if it's a corporate bond, then by all means, anything, any sustainability strategy that the company has worked so hard to build needs to be extended to their issuing. But also the underwriters like Goldman Sachs, like Bank of America, like JP Morgan, who some ex- are so proud of their second chance hiring, for example, they might be underwriting bonds. How can we, we're, we don't invest in those companies, how, but how can investors who look at banks and, and own banks engage them on that? So that was a thought. Wonderful. Great way to wrap up. I, this was a really engaging conversation. And um, as always, from these conversations, I feel like I always walk away with deeper understanding. So I'd like to thank each of you um, for joining me today in this conversation. And again, to thank our sponsors and all of you who attended. Um, just as a quick reminder, um, uh, we are um, we are hiring. Um, and so if one of my team member wants to drop the link for, that, uh, for those two positions, um, please uh, share that. Uh, if you'd like to support Reese and Croton Institute, you can do so by making um, a contribution or becoming a sponsor. Um, and the details are here. And once again, thank you all and have a great afternoon. <laughs>